Welcome back to another edition of What Planet Is This Really? On today's episode, Nymphaea Cerulea. Or is it Nymphaea Nuchalivar Cerulea? Nymphaea Stellata? Nymphaea Maculata? Castalia Cerulea? Does it have 28 chromosomes or 84? The Egyptian blue lily is just a big hot mess, and I'm here for it. As always, check the references below, and the germination protocol starts here. Also, I'm going to use the taxon Nymphaea cerulea, since that appears to be the most common usage in the literature. But that might not be the final accepted name, as I'll explain. To start things off right, I still don't know exactly what's going on here. There are about 50 species of Nymphaea, each with several different binomial and common names. Their attractive flowers and niche aquatic lifestyle has attracted a huge industry to develop thousands of cultivars. Most Nymphaea readily hybridize, sometimes without overtly changing the phenotype. Separate plants that are morphologically identified as the same species have been shown to possess widely varying number of chromosomes. All of this is confounded by trade secrecy, both from flower breeders trying to maintain control of their patented varieties and from plant extract vendors marketing their own super special variety of the fabled narcotic blue lily. Despite the name, the blue color isn't even the identifying feature of the species. As recently as 2017, genetic analysis shows blue, pink, and white flowers merely as different varieties of the same species, namely Nymphaea nuchali var nuchali for the blue and Nymphaea nuchali var versicolor for the white and pink. Still, other molecular evidence puts the blue nuchali into a completely different Capensis taxon and separate from Cerulea. Neither is the blue color unique to Cerulea. Some early taxonomists grouped all blue colored lilies under the same name, Nymphaea stellata. This included what is now called Nymphaea macrantha, Capensis, Cerulea, and many other species and hybrids. And this confusion goes all the way to the top. For nearly three decades, the depictions of the national flower of Sri Lanka were mislabeled. The images of Nuchali in official government documents was recently identified by genetic studies to be a hybrid of Nuchali and Macrantha. Furthermore, certified germplasm of Cerulea doesn't seem to be available, at least in the U.S. That's going to be a recurring theme for medicinal plant species. The Germplasm Resource Information Network the group who maintains plant genetics for research, is run by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The federal government can hardly be associated with anything even remotely drug-like, so those species are underrepresented in state-run germplasm facilities. I don't want to get too deep into identification in this video, except to share one story with you to elucidate the practical problems in locating a cerulea. I tried to obtain an authentic Cerulea rhizome from a large online vendor who is familiar with these issues. They produced a YouTube video talking about the identification problems, so I figured they would probably have the real thing. Unfortunately, they stopped carrying it only months before I inquired. Womp womp. They cited a lack of interest due to poor color saturation and difficulties in reproduction. I didn't want to buy from a random Etsy store or some unknown greenhouse's website unless I had to. Given the widespread misidentification issues, it was unlikely that either of these sources would have authentic cerulea. State-run botanical gardens, on the other hand, often have a process for requesting germplasm for research, education, or breeding purposes. The Missouri Botanical Garden System had an entry for a company based in Florida. Well, there were actually two entries, but the other was listed as dead. Sad. Anyway, I went to the company's website, and they do indeed have cerulea. They don't use stock images, and their plants seem to match the morphology from the literature. Since they are listed on the Living Collections Management System, it is reasonable to conclude that they are trustworthy. Great, I'll, I'll order some. Unfortunately, they are a distributor. They do not sell to individuals like me. Womp womp again. I send them an email to request a list of vendors, and they replied with just two. Around this time, I was browsing the Blue Lotus Flower subreddit. Well, I'm always browsing Reddit, but this one time in particular, I found someone who shared a lovely image of what appeared to be Nymphaea capensis, or some hybrid thereof. As it turns out, they had bought this Cerulea from one of the vendors on that list. Intrigued by the discrepancy, I chatted with the Redditor about their order and gathered some evidence of my own. Altogether, we know that the distributor had at least at one time, true cerulea, 
and that the distributor provided plants to the vendor. We also know that what the Redditor received was not true cerulea. Somewhere along the chain of custody, someone messed up. I can understand if the Redditor had bought seeds. As I mentioned, Nymphaea readily hybridize, so any seeds produced won't necessarily be true to type. Most respectable vendors include disclaimers on their seed listings to warn buyers about this problem. However, the Redditor had bought rhizomes just this year. Three of them, actually, since that's the minimum order quantity. We know from the Wayback Machine that the vendor had been selling cerulea since at least 2020, so there's no telling how many people have been affected. I have contacted the vendor and requested more information, but they didn't answer any of my relevant questions. Now maybe this is a one-time issue. Someone mixed up orders or mislabeled a young plant. I've made that mistake, and I don't even have a large greenhouse to manage. I don't think anyone is purposefully deceiving their customers into buying the wrong nymphaea. For most customers, anyway, the provenance doesn't matter so much as, ooh, that flower looks nice. But for the pedantic collector in me, I want the real thing. These unanswered questions were enough for me to place an order with the other vendor from that list. I received a lovely plant with several intact leaves less than a week later. To my surprise, it flowered just a few days after that, allowing me to confirm that this is indeed a true cerulea. Maybe that very plant will end up being the mother of all my future cerulea. So, yeah. That was a long way of saying that it's difficult to find the right thing. Even if a vendor had cerulea at one point, that's no guarantee that what you buy will be true. I still had to resort to purchasing rando seeds from a notably unreliable vendor for this germination video. I won't be able to get a positive ID on those seeds until more of the plant structures develop, namely the flowers, at least for an ID on the taxonomic level. There is still a chemotaxic identification to do. With all of those caveats and tangential stories out of the way, I would like to present a germination protocol for cerulea. I've tried my best to narrow down the research to cerulea specifically, but the protocol should be informative for any of the Brachycera subgenus. Unlike their land-dwelling counterparts, seed germination in Nymphaea cannot be dictated solely by hydration. Instead, cerulea appears to rely on a complex sequence of events including drying, settling, and anaerobic fermentation. This is perhaps why cerulea have a reputation for being difficult to start. Let's pretend for a moment that you are a cerulea seed just starting to develop. After two to three days of pollination by various bees, beetles, and flies, your flower is pulled beneath the waterline to fully mature. After all, you don't want the developing fruit to be eaten before it's ready. Since you had dozens of visitors, your flower is well fertilized and sinks in just a few short hours in response. Over the next three weeks or so, you and your hundreds of siblings will fully mature. A mucilaginous arrow grows up around you, trapping a small amount of air in the space between. And then, all at once, you are released. Instead of sinking to the bottom, the trapped air carries you to the surface to escape the dark depths that would surely starve a tiny seedling. The gentle currents slowly push you to the shoreline, where the depths are much more suitable to your small stature. During this time, some of your siblings were probably eaten by fish, birds, turtles, and anything else that mistakes your appearance for a small insect. They will be dispersed elsewhere, helping your species spread. After about a day, the arrow decays and you begin to sink. In the literal zone, you wait. Wait for the signals to begin growing. The winter season is particularly dry this year, and your shoreline recedes, exposing you to the air. No matter, you are an orthodox seed and tolerant to drying. Still, you wait. Early spring rains wash down over the shore and bury you in sediment and organic material. Still, you wait. Then the emergent sun heats your shallow bed and things begin to happen. Bacteria and fungi decompose the organic material buried with you. They consume so much oxygen in doing this that your environment becomes hypoxic. They even start to chomp down on you. Water seeps in through your decomposing seed coat and things start to look right. With your siblings and the microorganisms all around you consuming oxygen, your environment starts to fill with ethanol and ethylene. And now you know the time is right. Germination begins. As you can probably tell, Cerulea has some atypical germination conditions. Many nymphaea are viviparous, germinating immediately after maturity without any environmental cues. 
Cerulea's adaptations, on the other hand, helped it survive in the variable conditions of the Nile River Delta. In short, Cerulea requires scarification and germinate best in a warm, hypoxic, and well-lit environment. Replicating those conditions in the lab will take some doing. Firstly, scarification. Unlike most nymphaea, Cerulea seeds are covered in a mildly impermeable seed coat and tiny trichomes. The seed coat needs to be broken before germination. This happens either by microbial activity, as in nature, or by some synthetic method. Furthermore, the trichomes shield bacteria hidden underneath from chemical disinfectants, making oxenic seed germination quite difficult. The seed coat isn't so strong as to protect it from extended disinfection, however, so this is a game of balance. A short soak in sulfuric acid is probably the best method to mitigate physical dormancy and contamination at the same time. For fresh seeds that have not had a chance to form their hard seed coat, this isn't necessary, and probably why online resources suggest that these seeds are recalcitrant. Second, hypoxia. In addition to physical dormancy, cerulea possess chemical dormancy. Cerulea need to be exposed to the proper chemical signals to begin germinating. That chemical signal appears to be ethylene. In an extensive study of this phenomenon, 100 parts per million of ethophon, a commercially available compound that decomposes to ethylene, can significantly increase germination rates for Nymphaea odorata. Similar results are noted with Nymphaea alba. However, the greatest increase comes not from synthetic compounds, but from simple crowding. When 100 seeds are placed in only 20 milliliters of water, they have a germination rate of about 55%. If those same seeds were placed in 100 milliliters of water, their germination rate would be almost zero. This crowding effect is common to many nymphaea, and is likely to occur in cerulea, though it hasn't been tested directly. The ideal water volume appears to be approximately 0.2 to 0.1 milliliters per seed. Also, the seedlings can only stretch so far to meet the water surface, so the final height of the water above your seeds should be less than 5 centimeters. Finally, light and heat. As with all seeds, there exists an optimal germination temperature and a preference or no for photons. The optimal temperature lies somewhere around a constant 30 to 35 degrees Celsius with 35C winning slightly for a wide range of nymphaea. Though not directly tested in cerulea, many nymphaea show substantially reduced germination when subjected to wildly varying temperatures, such as those seen naturally at the end of the growing season. This might be another mechanism that allows nymphaea seeds to target their germination niche in the meteorological summer, with sufficient water for heat storage through the night. Similarly, all nymphaea germination studies I have read use 16-hour illumination, the photoperiod of midsummer. I can't seem to find any species of nymphaea that prefers darkness during germination, so it stands to reason that cerulea will be the same. So, scarification, crowding, and constant temperature of 30 to 35 C with 16 hour illumination is probably ideal for cerulea. As mentioned, I have some supposedly cerulea seeds upon which to demonstrate this germination protocol. I chose full sterilization because it's just one less variable to worry about. These procedures were performed in the same container that would go on to be the germination vial. That way, both the seeds and the vial were sterilized at the same time. I added my 50 seeds to a 7 milliliter glass vial. First, the seeds were immersed in 70% ethanol for one minute. This kills any actively growing microorganisms on the seed surface. Then the seeds were rinsed with distilled water and immersed in 0.6% sodium hypochlorite surfactant solution for 20 minutes. Bleach is more effective than alcohol at destroying metabolically inactive spores. Again, the seeds were rinsed in distilled water. The final pretreatment step was a soak in 75% sulfuric acid for one minute. This is sufficient to break physical dormancy without affecting germination rate too severely. Once finished, make sure to rinse the seeds several times to remove any remaining acid. Also, if you're going to be like me and combine waste bleach with waste acid, make sure you are working in a fume hood. That way you can immediately vent the resulting chlorine gas without poisoning yourself. In this trial, I used five milliliters of water for 50 seeds, or a ratio of 0.1 milliliter per seed. The vial was capped tightly to encourage oxygen deprivation and sat inside my germination chamber at 30 C. In less than a week, germinations began. 
In total, about a dozen seeds germinated, or about 25%. Not great, but sufficient for these probably old seeds. I can only give an estimate of the germination rate because some of the seeds became entangled in the vial, and not all the seedlings survived the various transfer stages. The six-ish remaining seedlings are growing well now, and I will keep you updated on their progress. Also, I am experimenting with alternative pretreatments because, well, sulfuric acid isn't a standard material for the home gardener, and transferring those tiny delicate seedlings is a pain. Sanding these millimeter-sized seeds doesn't seem to be viable for breaking physical dormancy. Depending on the chemical composition of the seed coat, rinsing with an organic solvent like acetone or ether might be worth investigating, but that's just a guess. For chemical dormancy mitigation, dilute ethanol might be a possibility. I'm currently testing a 350 millimolar ethanol solution. After more than a month, however, no seeds have germinated. I was expecting them to take a little bit longer as they are relying on natural degradation of the seed coat. But a month is pushing it, so I don't hold much hope for this method. In closing, I just want to remind you that all of these recommendations are rather fluid. As mentioned before, there is still debate on the exact taxonomy of Nymphaea cerulea. Many of the conclusions of this video were drawn from a related species, or what I determined to be cerulea, despite a different name given in the article. I'm sure that I will post an update video when I can collect more evidence myself, perhaps using my own seeds. Anyway, that's it for now. Cerulea seeds are covered in a mildly imp imp impermeable. impermeable. This happens either by microbial activity, as in microbial common names. Murphy, do you have to pick this time? Start eating?